I want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we are going to have adult classes each night of VBS. Of course, we'll be starting at 7 every other night of the week, and so we hope that as you drop your children off or maybe you uh, have grandkids or maybe you don't have kids participating, we still love to see you in here and, and listening to some fine lessons. And we're going to kick it off tonight with Noah Davis. How many of you knew that we have an intern this summer? Don't know that we've made that really clear. He's only been with us about a week or so. But Noah Davis is our intern this summer. He's mainly working with our youth, but we are going to be utilizing him in several different capacities while he's here as we try to help him learn the ropes of ministry. And uh, he's got a really good start. He comes from a great family. Many of you know his dad, Brian Davis, who is heavily involved with World Bible School, a mission that we are heavily involved with as well as a congregation. Noah went through every year of preacher training camp except the first one. He just finished his freshman year at Freed Hardeman, and I think you're going to be very impressed with Noah, and I hope that you will take the time to get to know him as he will be with us all summer. And so I'm blessed to introduce you to our intern this summer, Noah Davis. Good evening. Talking about introductions, um, this last week at preacher training camp, I was involved a little bit with what was going on, and a lot of people would come up to me and say, well, we're welcome here. I'm glad you're, you're here at camp with us and that you're a camper. No, not quite, but I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm really looking forward to this summer. I'm glad for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I've been asked a couple times if I'm speaking on hellfire and brimstone, and as much as the theme looks like that, that is not what the lesson is on tonight. Um, tonight we're talking about being fired up. And one of the first things I think about when we talk about being fired up is sports fans. Sports fans are incredibly energetic and passionate for their sports teams. They'll do some crazy, maybe even kind of stupid things to show support for their team. And so one of the stories that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight is about something that happened on the Auburn University campus back in late 2010. Some of you may know this story. So the Auburn Tigers and the Alabama Crimson Tide have a pretty fierce rivalry. And uh, one Alabama fan decided that he would, after Alabama lost to Auburn in a, in a bowl game, he was going to poison the oak trees on Auburn's campus. Well, these oak trees for centuries had been a place where students gathered to celebrate victories um, on the football field. Well, he poisoned them. They died. Ironically, Auburn went on to win the national championship that year. And so... A little bit after that championship, this guy named Harvey Updike came on the radio and confessed what he had done to their oak trees. Well, the police arrested him. He was um, given a three-year sentence, five years probation. Um, he was banned from the Auburn campus. He was banned from future collegiate sport events. And he was fined nearly $800,000 in restitution to the university. Now, I was going to make a joke here about Alabama fans, but in case there's any in here, I'll refrain because we know what they're capable of now. Um, but he was so fired up for his team that it led him to do something very unwise. He let his passion for the wrong thing misguide him, lead him down a road that he really didn't want to go to, that has consequences that he's still dealing with today. And as we kick off VBS, we're going to look at another person who was fired up and passionate for the wrong thing. So we'll be in Daniel chapter 3 tonight. Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We're going to talk about Nebuchadnezzar and his passion. What was, what was he fired up for? So starting in verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, and the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. It's incredibly easy to lose sight of what's important 
to become fired up for the wrong thing in this world. That's very much the case with Nebuchadnezzar. Back in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream, and God had showed Daniel the interpretation of the dream. Daniel was the only one who could interpret it. Nebuchadnezzar's dream was about a statue made of different materials, different metals, with the head being made of gold, representing King Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom of Babylon. Now, all those kingdoms of earth were going to be destroyed, and the interpretation of the dream was that God was going to, or God's kingdom would be the only one to last forever. So upon hearing that in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar praised God um, for how great and how powerful he was, and he promoted Daniel and Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, when you fast forward to chapter 3, something changed. That obviously didn't stick with him. He, he may have respected God for a little bit, but his heart was not changed. And he builds this idol, this statue, ironically out of gold, um, which is what represented him in his dream. And so people aren't exactly sure if the statue was to a god or if it was Nebuchadnezzar himself. But regardless, Nebuchadnezzar was really fired up and passionate for the statue. Um, he was so fired up and passionate, in fact, that he wanted every official in his kingdom to worship it. And if they weren't fired up for it, he would fire them up, quite literally by throwing them into a fiery furnace. So what happens? Everyone bows down. Now, unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar's passion was directed at the wrong thing. And it makes me wonder how many times we direct our passion at the wrong thing. Like the story I just mentioned, we can direct our passion at sports, or at other people's opinions, or our own desires, or entertainment, our jobs. There's so many things that we can be on fire about, but that can cause us to forget who we're truly supposed to be on fire for, and that's God. This is what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He was so focused on his desires, on his statue, that he forgot about the God that had just interpreted his dream, who was the only one worthy of praise and worship. Jesus himself addresses people about this in Mark chapter 4. Starting in verse 18, it says, And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown in the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. Don't let the passion and desires of this world choke out the Lord and his word, like Nebuchadnezzar did. Rather, we should direct our passion to the Lord. We should be fired up for him and his word. Let's continue reading in chapter 3, starting in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? So the Chaldeans were part of the Babylonian Empire, um, and they probably had some sort of authority and prestige. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that they were pretty jealous of these Jews, these foreigners who had come in and received a lot of favor from the king, specifically these three men. And so, and the reason I think this is when it says that they maliciously accused the Jews, and that word maliciously means with intent to do harm. They weren't telling Nebuchadnezzar about these men out of a sense of justice or doing what's right. They, they had intent to do harm to these men. And so it's apparent that not quite everyone bowed down to the idol. Three men stood for what they believed in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the Chaldeans now see an opportunity to get rid of them and take their places of power. They even butter the king up. They say, oh, king, live forever. And that sounds pretty good if someone was asking me for something and said, oh, no, I'll live forever. I, I might listen. Then they appealed to Nebuchadnezzar's pride in verse 12 by saying, These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So this story is not really about the statue anymore. It's more about Nebuchadnezzar and what he's done in building the statue and what he wants. 
which is for people to worship his statue. Nebuchadnezzar is on fire for himself. The statue is now just an extension kind of of his pride, of his own ego. The Chaldeans know this, and they're going to use this to try to get what they want. They turn in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the king. So what happens when you say no to somebody who is extremely prideful? Usually they get angry. They might even be surprised. They might turn violent. And that's exactly what happens to Nebuchadnezzar in this story. When he finds out that these three men have not obeyed him and pleased his ego, he throws a fit. He's furious. He questions if it's really true, as if he couldn't believe that someone would dare defy him. I mean, he's Nebuchadnezzar, right? But then he gets violent and threatens their lives. Nebuchadnezzar is so passionate for himself that if anyone opposes him and what he wants, he'll do anything to punish them, no matter how ungodly it may be. And if you still aren't convinced that Nebuchadnezzar is on fire for himself, read the end of verse 15. It says, this is Nebuchadnezzar to these, to these men, And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Wow. The, the nerve it takes to say that, to make a statement like that, is unbelievable. King Nebuchadnezzar is so on fire for himself that he's not only willing to execute godly men, but he's willing to place himself above God and challenge the authority and power of God. I pray that we would never be so fired up about something, someone, or even ourselves that we would justify ungodly behavior or that we would put ourselves on a pedestal above God. Those misdirected passions cause us to justify all these things when in fact they are very unjust um, and sinful. Nebuchadnezzar, I guarantee you, felt completely justified to condemn these men and execute them. Because if everything's about him, then if they defy him, it's okay if he does whatever he wants to them. Nebuchadnezzar felt completely justified putting himself above God. Because if everything is really about Nebuchadnezzar, God doesn't matter that much. I think about things today that we might take and put in a place such as that. You think about money and our jobs. Um, how will, some people will do anything to get more money, to get that promotion, to get that raise. Um, you see it in a lot of legal cases. Um, so I hope that you see the, the danger of being fired up for the wrong thing. <clears throat> in Philippians chapter 3, um, Paul talks about how he has every reason to be confident in himself and the things of this world, but, he, but he's not. He counts it all as loss. For what? Because he knows that knowing Christ Jesus is more important than all the things in this world combined. In Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 4, he says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, become like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. We need to be fired up for Jesus. It's as simple as that. Our passion for Jesus should lead to faith, obedience. And that obedience in him um, well, once we are obedient to him, you know, and become a Christian, he will, we will be made righteous. And because of that, we'll be resurrected and taken to heaven when Jesus returns. Nothing and no one else that you were fired up for will be able to do what Jesus can do for you. So let's continue the story. Let's look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response, starting in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand firm against the king's threat, and they show him whom they truly are fired up for. And their first answer to Nebuchadnezzar is that they don't really need to answer him. And that sounds kind of odd, but I think it makes sense. I mean, they've been living and working with the king for quite some time now. He should know where they stand on this matter. He should know that they won't bow down to God. And I hope that we're like that 
where we work and where we live. People know what we believe and what we stand for. Second of all, they hadn't bowed down the first time they heard these consequences. Why would they bow down, bow down the second time? Nothing's changed that would cause them to lose their faith in the Lord. And then they do say a few more things um, in their answer to Nebuchadnezzar. And I think that these few words are some of the most powerful, courageous, and inspiring words in the Bible. First, they reaffirm their allegiance to the Lord by saying, Our God, whom we serve. Then they address Nebuchadnezzar's challenge to God's power and authority. They make it very, very clear that God is able to deliver them not only from the furnace, but from Nebuchadnezzar himself. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be examples to us today. This story shows us that being fired up for God is going to ensure that we have to go through the fires of life. However, that shouldn't phase us. It didn't phase these three. They were truly fired up for God regardless of the consequences. Whether life was good for them as high-ranking officials in Babylon, or whether it was bad when they were being threatened to be thrown into a furnace, they were faithful no matter what. They trusted God in a very difficult time to trust Him in. And I hope that we're like that. How often do we say that we're fired up for God, but then when difficulties come, we bail on Him? Truly being fired up for God means that we're committed to Him in the good and the bad, even when the fires of life are, are so hot that we don't think we can bear them. We stay faithful to Him. We must trust in God in every situation because we know that He knows best for us and He'll take care of us. But then there comes the question, what, what about when God doesn't deliver us? What about when God doesn't save my parent, my sibling, my spouse, my child from death? What about when God doesn't give me my job back? We're never promised that God will deliver us from every physical trial. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were aware of this. However, they still held firm in their faith to the Lord because they knew that even if He didn't deliver them physically, He would deliver them spiritually. We have that same hope as Christians. In 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3, it talks about that hope and that joy that we can have. It reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by, very, grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it has been tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls." A Christian's inheritance of eternal life is imperishable. We can have joy in that fact, even though we go through fires of life. Because as Christians, if we are Christians who are truly on fire for God, we will receive the outcome of our faith, like it talks about in 1 Peter, which is eternal deliverance through the salvation of our souls. That is way more powerful than any physical deliverance that we could ever receive. So let's finish the story. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 3. Starting in verse 19, it reads, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it usually was, or usually was heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's orders was, order was urgent, and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. So now the story gets really interesting. This is the part that we've always heard of growing up. Nebuchadnezzar loses it after these three men defy him and reaffirm they're not going to bow down. Verse 19 says his expression changes against them. You can only imagine how this must have looked. He probably feels really good about himself after threatening them, thinking... There's nothing they can do. There's no way they're going to defy me now. But then they do. And he gets angry. You can see his face getting red as he can't believe what he's hearing from these three men. In his burst of rage, he has the fire heated to be as hot as possible. And it almost seems he's gone a little crazy because his own men are killed by it. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown in the fire. So what happens? Let's read in verse 24. 
King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw the fire had not any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. So after this bait has been had over who is mightier, Nebuchadnezzar or God, God shows up and directly intervenes to show King Nebuchadnezzar who truly is more powerful and who is deserving of our passion, our praise, and our worship. He delivers these three Jews from the fire, and when they come out, they're not singed. They haven't even been touched. You can't smell the smoke and the fire on them. This miracle is so powerful, it grabs someone as with a hardened heart like Nebuchadnezzar. He, he reacts to this. He reacts so strongly that he goes down close to the fire and personally calls them out probably risking his life. His men just died getting close to the fire. He's so, he's so struck by this, by this miracle that he can't help but call them out. He calls them servants of the Most High God, showing that he recognizes that God is greater than him and his statue. Something I think that's overlooked in this passage is that many of the men that had just bowed down to this golden image were there. So I doubt Nebuchadnezzar was the only one affected that day. They saw the power of God that day too. So let's finish it up. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Chapter 3 ends in an incredible way when you consider how it started. King Nebuchadnezzar, a prideful king who would do anything to make people worship this idol, this statue, praises God. And he decrees that his entire empire respect God. Why? What happened that caused this change? Well, as verse 28 tells us, Nebuchadnezzar witnessed the impact that being fired up for God has he witnessed how God takes care of his people. He witnessed that God was more powerful than him or any, any other lowercase g God could ever be. It is God and our faith in him that can break through the hardest hearts and reach the worst of sinners. Being fired up for God will affect you, and it will affect the, affect the world around you, as we can see in Daniel chapter 3. First off, being fired up for God will bless you on this earth, but more importantly, in an eternal sense. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's passion and faith in the Lord led to their physical deliverance and led to them being promoted. So as a Christian, I should expect to be delivered from every problem I ever face and to receive a promotion pretty soon in the near future at my job. Can I get a confirmation of that for one of the elders? Am I getting a promotion soon? No, that's not what we're promised, not at all. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not promised that. However, they knew that and they were still faithful. Fired up, faithful, obedient Christians do have the blessing of our Christian family, however. The church helps us get through the fires of, that life throws at us. The church is there to encourage us, to teach us, and to love us in the hardest times of life. Even more than that, fired up Christians have the blessing of complete confidence in knowing where we will be in eternity. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, which reads, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Deliverance from spiritual fire is an infinitely greater blessing than deliverance from physical fire. Also, being fired up for God will impact the world and point others to Him. What kind of impact did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have on the Babylonian Empire? Well, because they were so fired up, they completely changed how an entire empire viewed God. See, at first, to the Babylonians, the Jews were a failure of a nation. They couldn't even protect themselves. Therefore, the God they worshipped couldn't be that important, couldn't be that powerful. He seemed pretty small to the Babylonians, but not anymore. All it took was three men's faith and passion for the Lord to change the Babylonian world. Nebuchadnezzar, upon seeing this, orders that his kingdom respect and not say anything bad against the Lord God. 
the Babylonians saw God for who he truly was, all-powerful, supreme, and deserving of our praise and worship. So can the church have an impact like this today? I think that we absolutely can. In Acts 17, Paul and the early church were accused of turning the world upside down, and that's exactly what they did. They were so on fire for God that everyone, well, most everyone would have heard by the church when they were, heard about the church when they were done. And so many people were attracted to that fire, to that light that they were showing. A lot of people became Christians because of the fire that they showed. And I think that we should be like that today. But if we are lazy, go through the motion Christians, we're not going to attract a single soul. We must be constantly learning, growing, igniting that fire for the Lord. And if we do that, there's no telling how many people will be drawn to the church. It reminds me of Matthew um, chapter 5, verse 16, a verse you've probably all heard, which says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When we shine our light, our fire, it makes a difference in this dark world. Not everyone's going to like it, but some will. Some will see it and want to be a part of that Christian life that brings joy and hope and peace and comfort and love. Then those that are living in darkness will step into the light and hopefully be as fired up as you are. At least I hope that you're that fired up. Being fired up for God makes a difference. It made a difference 2,000 years ago in Babylon, and it makes a difference today wherever we are. Simply being a passionate person is not enough. Nebuchadnezzar was just as passionate and on fire for himself and his statue as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were for the Lord. So then what's the difference? The difference is who you were fired up for. As we talked about, you can, be, you can be fired up for the wrong things, but it'll lead to some disastrous consequences in your life. Maybe physically, but definitely eternally. Therefore, we should be fired up for the Lord. And finally, being fired up for the Lord will impact individuals and the world as a whole in ways that we may not always know, but ways that will glorify God and benefit His kingdom. So I challenge you, examine where you put your time and energy and focus and money. If you were to make a pie chart of, that represented the hours of your average day, what percentage of that pie chart is given to God? That will be a pretty good indicator of what you're fired up for, what you're passionate about. I've done that before, and it, it's, it's pretty eye-opening. Um, sometimes not in a good way, but it helps you to, to see where you're at. Being fired up for God, or be fired up for God, because He is fired up for you. He wants a relationship with you, a relationship where He will lead you through every fire, that life could throw at you. And eventually, he'll bring you home to him, where you will live with him for eternity. So as I close, I hope that you are more on fire for God today than you've ever been. But I realize that life is full of struggles, and our fire can fade. It can get dim. So if you have been struggling with commitment or dedication to the Lord, then we're here to help you. We're here to pray for you. We're here to help you spark that fire again. If you feel like the fires of life have burned you, and you feel discouraged, we're here to help carry those burdens with you and encourage you. Maybe you've never committed to the Lord. You've never been on fire for Him, and you wish to do so tonight by repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and being baptized um, into the, and becoming a member of the church, and living a new life where you can be fired up for God every day of that new life. Whatever you need, please come tonight as we stand and we sing.